Uh, I'm Alan Downey. I, I teach at Olin College. My slides are there. If you want to load up the slides ahead of time, you can. So if I say anything interesting, you don't have to take a picture of my slides. Uh, I teach at Olin College. It's a small school just outside of Boston. Our mission is to fix engineering education. One of the ways I'm doing that is by teaching Bayesian statistics to undergraduates. I have to give credit, my illustrations here are all from the Phantom Tollbooth. How many people have read the Phantom Tollbooth? All right, this talk will make just a little bit more sense if, if you're familiar with the book. So my thesis is that Bayesian methods have been the victim of a, of a smear campaign that is almost 200 years old now. If you're interested in the history of all this, this is an excellent book called The Theory That Would Not Die that gets you some of the early history. But the result is that a lot of what you've heard are myths about Bayesian statistics. Supposedly, it's hard, it's slow, the results that you get are subjective. We don't need this anyway because it's redundant. None of that is true, but just to explain. So most places, Bayesian statistics is a graduate level topic. You have to learn a whole lot of math and then you can learn conventional frequentist stats, and then maybe as a graduate student, you get to start doing Bayesian statistics. And if you pick up a statistics textbook, Bayesian stats, this is a very popular Bayesian statistics book. This is page seven. At this point, you only have 563 pages to go, so it is at least at first a little intimidating. The other, as we've heard a couple of times today, Bayesian methods tend to be computationally intensive, so maybe they don't scale up to big data. And as I said, the results that you get are all dependent on your prior beliefs. So they're subjective, and if you're doing objective science, then maybe that's not acceptable to you. And then the other thing that you'll hear is that even if the, even if the priors are objective, the results that you get at the end are pretty much the same as what you get from frequentist stats, so why bother with any of this? And furthermore, hey, we're doing great. You know, science and engineering are taking off. Why do we need to worry about this at all? This is Ronald Fisher, influential statistician in the 20th century, basically explaining that all of this is a bad idea. Not so fast. I think Bayes has been getting short shrift. What I want to do is bring rhyme and reason back to the kingdom. And I'll do that by addressing what I think are the myths that I just presented. Not quite in the same order I presented them. Number three, the results that you get are subjective because they depend on the prior. That is true. Live with it. But I claim that that is actually a good thing. Specifically, it is an IJ good thing. This is what IJ good had to say about this topic, that Bayesian methods take your models and make them explicit. You're not pretending to be objective. You are addressing the fact that you're being subjective, putting your model on the table, and making that a topic of discussion, and making sure that you know what you don't know. So making your model explicit is a good thing. Also, if you have enough data, people with different priors will converge. If you don't have enough data that different priors converge, then you need to know that, and quantifying that convergence helps you know what you don't know. We don't need Bayesian methods because everything is great, right? Well, not so much. We have reason to believe that many published findings are wrong. This is a paper that talks about, let me see if I got these in the right order. Some journals are explicitly banning classical statistics. I think this is actually kind of a big mess that we're dealing with. I don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. There are a lot of classical statistical methods like, like regression that are, of course, enormously powerful tools. But specifically, the tools of statistical inference, confidence intervals, and hypothesis testing, I believe that the world would be a better place if null hypothesis significance tests had never existed. The claim that things are redundant is the one that I find particularly baffling, because people say that the Bayesian methods yield the same result as the frequentist stats. They don't yield the same kind of thing. Frequentist stats will give you point estimates. 
and confidence intervals. What you get from Bayesian methods is a posterior distribution. That distribution tells you all the possible outcomes, the possible values, and the probability associated with each possible outcome. So that's a different type. It's a different kind of thing. So it can't possibly be the same as the frequentist result. You can kind of make them be comparable if you take a posterior distribution which has all the values in it, and you collapse it down to a point estimate or an interval, you can compare that to a classical estimate. But that's a silly thing to do. It's like comparing a car to an airplane, except that the rules are that the airplane has to stay on the ground. I'll give you a couple of examples to explain concretely what I mean. So polling, uh, uh, electoral results is a classic example. You survey, let's say, a few hundred people. 52% of them indicate that they're going to vote for one of the candidates, Alice. You can get a confidence interval on what that estimate is. You can get a p-value that tells you who knows what a p-value is. And the question that people will naturally want to know is, what's the probability that Alice will win? Classical statistics flatly refuses to answer that question. This is a diagram from a friend of mine who, who shows here graphically that the set of things that p-values can tell you and the set of things that you care about do not overlap. <laughs> As contrasted with a posterior distribution, again, this tells you all the possible outcomes for this election and probabilities associated with each one. So you can answer questions in the form of probabilities. And furthermore, the Bayesian methods tell you how to do an update when new data come in. So you have a prior that's based on previous polls, you do an update based on the latest poll, and that posterior in the lower right-hand corner is what you should believe given the sum of all the data that you've seen. This, by the way, is from the 538.com explanation of how they did their Senate forecasts, which were pretty good. So this is one important point that I want to make. Bayesian methods answer the questions that we actually care about and make the data that you have actionable. Second example is something like comparing two drugs. You've got a new treatment for a particular condition. You run a, you know, drug A versus drug B, and you find a difference between them that has a very small p-value. But maybe the new drug A is a more expensive drug. So as a doctor, the question you care about is which drug should I prescribe? Frequentist stats provides very little guidance for this question. As contrasted with a posterior distribution, all right, there we go. If you have a posterior distribution on the difference between A and B, and you have information about their prices, and you have information about side effects and other things like that, you can do analysis like dollars per life saved, and you can evaluate different interventions in, in a sensible, sensible way. I'll do one more example that's a little bit more fun. This is if you're ever on the Price is Right, at the end of the show, you have the showdown, and they show you a prize, and you have to guess the price, and then they show your opponent a prize, they have to guess the price, and then whoever is closest without going over wins the prize. I love this example because the reward function is asymmetric and it has a sharp cutoff. So it doesn't lend itself to analytical methods, but with computational methods, it's very straightforward. All you have to do is watch the show for a couple of years, which fortunately someone has done for me and recorded the price of all the prizes. So this is what you should believe. These are your priors. If you're contestant number one or contestant number two, you know what you should believe about the prize before you see the prize. And then when you see it, you use your estimate as a noisy measurement of the prize of the thing and use that to do an update. So this is contestant number one, which is you in my scenario. You see a, 20, a prize that you think is worth $20,000, and you update from the dark blue prior to the light blue posterior. That's what you should believe about the prize after having seen it. Your opponent does the same thing. This is contestant number two. Let's say that your opponent thinks that the prize is worth $40,000. That's what the posterior would be. And now you can use that to do an optimization. This is, as a function of your bid on the x-axis there, this is your expected return on the y-axis. And you can see that the peak of that is what you should bid. That's the bid that optimizes your return. 
interesting point here is that those are very sharp peaks, which means that you actually need to do some analysis to get this right, and, and being accurate will maximize your expected return. This is an example of a way that Bayesian methods allow you to do complex decision analysis under uncertainty. So this is the basis of my claim that these things are not redundant. When you compare Bayesian methods and frequentist methods, it's not that the Bayesian methods are doing the same things better. It's that they allow you to, different, to do different things, and those things are better things. I want to come back to one of the other claims about Bayesian methods, which is that they are slow. That is somewhat true, but I want to clarify. First of all, if you want the right answer, you might have to wait for it. If, you are, if a wrong answer is acceptable, I can get one for you very fast. <laughs> but the other is that there, there are a range of ways of implementing Bayesian methods. Uh, I often start with what I call a brute force approach. These are grid algorithms where you just enumerate all possible hypotheses and compute the likelihood of every hypothesis. It's conceptually very simple. It's a good way of doing model building as a way of developing your understanding of the problem, but it doesn't scale up very well. That's an understatement. It scales very, very badly. An alternative is Monte Carlo Markov chain, which we heard a little bit about. This is an implementation using PyMC, also in Python. It's a straightforward way of expressing your model in code, and the implementation is much more computationally efficient. So this does scale up to moderate to large scale data sets. And then one last alternative, many of these methods have analytic solutions that you can think of as being a radical kind of optimization of taking very often linear algorithms and turning them into constant time algorithms when there is an analytic solution. One of the other accusations is that this is all very hard. If you do this analytically, it can be hard. There is some pretty heavy math in here. However, taking a computational approach makes things much simpler pretty much all of the integrals suddenly become for loops. And if you have a little bit of programming experience, a for loop is not all that scary. I teach a class where I use this computational approach. I have a bunch of college sophomores. It's only a seven week class. But at the end of that class, they're able to take interesting problems that they craft themselves and write solutions. Uh, and then I take their solutions and publish them in my blog. This is one example from the last time I offered the class. Uh, this was a, a couple of students who worked on predicting the outcome of the Super Bowl. Sure enough, they predicted that Seattle would throw an interception in the fourth quarter. Um, <laughs> this was a group that studied Tinder. Apparently, if you swipe right and after some time has passed, someone has not replied, you don't know whether they logged in, saw you, and swiped left, or maybe they haven't logged in yet, so there's still hope. You can analyze that and figure out the probability that they might still log in and swipe right. Uh, obviously not the most important problem in the world, but an example of something that's real world that used data that they collected that was an interesting problem they wanted to work on. Similarly, these guys worked on predicting how long a character in Game of Thrones is likely to survive. <laughs> the answer is, generally speaking, not good. So there are certainly parts of this that are hard. Learning to think in a Bayesian way takes some time. But taking a computational approach, I think, can make this a straightforward process. Given people who have basic programming skills and about seven weeks, we can get them there. So just to summarize the myths, it's subjective. Get over it. But there are parts of that that are good, especially making your model explicit. Uh, I think that this is, is particularly an important time in science, if not so much in engineering, where, where these methods are critical. They are not redundant. They do a different thing. They answer the questions you actually care about. They can be slow, but there are options there for making them scale. And again, taking this computational approach, I think, makes these things very approachable. Although I have to admit that I have uh, an incentive here, I'm, I'm, I'm not impartial. So I teach workshops where I try to explain how to get started with Bayesian methods. 
Um, and I have a book on the topic, which is Think Bays, published by our friends at O'Reilly, also available uh, under a Creative Commons license at thinkbays.com. So if this is interesting and you want to pick it up from here, please check that out. In my slides, I won't have time to present, but uh, I have a few additional slides here with additional readings that I recommend. I think I have a minute to take a question. I'm also, this is four ways to get in touch with me. And again, my slides are there. And I'm also, uh, during the break, at th we have a break at 3.35. I'm gonna go hang around at the O'Reilly booth. So if you would like to talk to me about any of this stuff, that would be a good place to catch me. But if you've got a question now, I'm happy to take one. What do you do if you don't have a prior? Question is, what do you do if you don't have a prior? I have two thoughts on that. One is, you always have some background information. And it might take some work to quantify that and express it in the form of a prior. Another thought is, if you really truly don't know anything, what you can do is a multiple model analysis, where you start with several different priors that might represent what different people believe, run that analysis, and then the divergence of that result will let you quantify your uncertainty about what's going on. So at the very least, you will know what you don't know. Yes? Any tips for uh, communicating results to people who just wait until you say what the p-value is? <laughs> Are there any tips for communicating results for people who just ask you what's the p-value? You know, people, when they ask that question, they almost always, what they really want is a probability. They want to know what's the probability that this hypothesis is true, and a Bayesian method can answer that question. One of the things that's nice about communicating these results is that you can communicate them in a way that people understand. So things like, yes, the probability that your hypothesis is correct is 50% or whatever it is. Or in the example that I gave of an optimization, you can show you know, expected return as a function of your actions. Um, I think it's a nice thing about Bayesian methods that you, you can communicate the results in the language that people understand. Yes? What's behind the smear campaign? You know, I, it's a weird historical question. I think that the book that I mentioned, the, the theory, the, what is it, the theory that dare not speak its name? Uh, <laughs> what's, I'm drawing a blank on the title. The theory that would not die. Uh, does a much better job of explaining the history. But a big part of it actually was the force of personality of two major figures in statistics in the 20th century. It almost really came down to the 400 pound gorilla who, who stopped it. Yes? When you say it's subjective to so get over it, meaning right. is everything subjective, this approach just makes it explicit? Correct. So when I say it's subjective, get over it, what I mean is, I'm just paraphrasing what, what you asked, everything is subjective. And, and so this is really no worse. And I think that's exactly right. That the uh, you know, frequentist methods try very hard to maintain the illusion of being objective, but they're not actually. You're kidding yourself, and you're much better off not kidding yourself. I will stop there. Thank you all very much.